Hi everyone and welcome back. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you've all recovered from last week's video because that was intense. I also want to thank you all for wishing me well because obviously I was ill and I still kind of am ill. I'm feeling a lot better though but we're still going. We're powering through. But in today's case we are heading back to the UK and we are going to be covering one of the most infamous true crime cases in recent times from the UK and that is the case of Raoul Moat. So Raoul, um, he was a bully. He was a very scary, very intimidating person. He was also a violent an abuser. He was just all round, not a nice person. And he thought that he could do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and not face any consequences. And the thing with people like Raoul, it's very common with bullies and abusers like Raoul. They blame everyone else for their problems and they don't take a good long look in the mirror. And because he thought that the world was against him, he wanted revenge. And he did this in the most brutal and horrific way. Raoul wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. He turned on his close ones. He turned on the police. And he even turned on innocent members of the public. He's killing people. He's killing people. Northumbria police are searching for a suspect. You police have took too much off me over the years. Are you taking this serious now? And then he went on the run. Raoul became the UK's most wanted man. And it soon turned into the biggest manhunt that this country has ever seen. Even to this very day, the hunt for Raoul Mo is the biggest manhunt ever. Which is so shocking when you think about the kind of criminals that have come from the UK. So we have a lot to get through in today's case as always. So let's just dive right in. So I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object murder mystery game where you play as Detective June Parker and each new level takes you through a thrilling mystery where you find as many hidden objects as possible to help you solve the murder. Now you guys know how I feel about June's Journey. Journey. I love June's Journey so much. It is just a game that I just find so relaxing. I get to completely zone out and the design of the game is just so gorgeous. I mean this is just an example but look at this. Look at the detail and it's just so satisfying when you find a hidden object. And is it just me but I love to find all of the objects without zooming in. Like I really challenge myself and I can literally spend hours playing June's Journey. But it's not just the hidden object element that I love. The storyline is incredible. It's a big murder mystery where you're trying to find out who murdered June's sister. However, things are not always that simple in June's journey. There are a lot of twists and turns along the way. A lot of family secrets get uncovered. There is just a lot going on. There's a lot to unpack and because it is a murder mystery game, I know you're all gonna love it. And I know so many of you already do love June's journey, but for those of you that don't play June's journey, I know you will love this game. And then on top of all of that, June's journey now has this new amazing part of the game called secrets. Each secret dives into some juicy storylines behind some of your favorite characters from June's Journey and I have been thoroughly enjoying it. And then June's Journey have recently had their Wildlife Week event. Did you guys play it? You could collect some gorgeous animal decorations for your island. However, more importantly, as part of this event, June's Journey donated $100,000 to the Snow Leopard Trust in order to protect snow leopards and the ecosystem in the Himalayas. So we got to play an incredible event, but it was so much bigger than that, which is just absolutely incredible. June's Journey is just truly the best all round. The game has a ton, so many active players. The community around June's Journey is huge. There are always new chapters, new decorations and new features. And if you don't already play June's Journey, I know you will love this game and you should go check out June's Journey right now. And June's Journey is available on iOS and Android as well as on PC through Facebook games. And you can download June's Journey for free by going to the link in my description box. And by using that link in my description box really does have out this channel so I would really appreciate it if you did use that link. Thank you again to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video but thank you to every single one of you watching right now because truly without all of you guys I wouldn't get opportunities like this and now let's jump into today's case. Now this is just a really really weird coincidence but Raoul Mote was born on the 17th of June 1973 and I'm posting this video on the 18th of June so Raoul's birthday was yesterday and I didn't plan that obviously so so Raoul Mote 
is a Gemini and he grew up in the West End area of Newcastle, which is a city in the north of England, where he lived with his older brother, Angus, and his mom, Josephine. Now, growing up, Rao's childhood was pretty disruptive. From the moment Rao was born, he was never told who his dad was, his biological father. So his mom, Josephine, got pregnant and she never told the father of the baby that she was pregnant. She left that man and she gave birth and the man didn't know that he had a child and she never told her child, which was Raoul, who his dad was. But this was not the first time that Josephine had done this. She had done the exact same thing to her older son, Angus. Angus also didn't know who his dad was. And the man who was Angus's dad also didn't know that he had a son. So there's a little bit of a pattern emerging with Josephine, isn't there? And throughout their childhood and into their teenage years, Josephine never told them who their dad was. And the two boys would constantly ask their mom who their dad was. They wanted to know who their dad was, but Josephine flat out refused to ever tell them. And I don't know why, there may have been a good reason why she didn't tell her sons who their father was, but I don't know. But Raoul and Angus just felt like there was this huge hole in their life. They felt so different to their peers. So that is like the first major issue in Raoul's childhood. But then on top of all of that, Josephine was not a good parent at all. She was very distant. She was emotionally unavailable. She was also known to be incredibly selfish. She would disappear for long periods of time and Raoul and Angus would be left to be raised by their grandmother. But whenever Josephine was around, she could sometimes be abusive to her children. She would beat the two boys if they ever misbehaved, if they ever stepped out of line. She would also do pretty extreme things. Like there was one time where she burned all of her children's toys because they misbehaved. And then when Raoul was 13 years old, his mother married for the first time. So now Raoul has a stepfather. And Raoul has spent his whole life looking for his dad, and now he has a fatherly figure in his life. However, this stepdad was also not a good person. His stepfather was said to be a very strict disciplinarian and borderline abusive himself. And Raoul just grew further and further away from his family. And then we get to 1990 and Raoul is 17 years old. He had just left school and he became completely estranged from his family. He just completely cut them off. He didn't want anything to do with them, didn't want anything to do with his mom. And he even cut off his older brother, Angus. Now it was at this point in Raoul's life that he underwent a pretty drastic transformation because this is when Raoul got into bodybuilding and he became obsessed with weightlifting, with bulking up. And he went from weighing approximately 12 stone to 17 stone in a very, very short space of time, which for those of you that don't know what 17 stone is, like if you don't measure weight in that, it is around 240 pounds. And because he did it in such a short space of time, you might be wondering, well, how did he do that? Well, of course, he did it by steroids. He was also six foot three, so he was a pretty intimidating figure. And Raoul was using steroids all the time. And it didn't take long for the steroids to have a very negative effect on his personality. Because Raoul, he was always known to be disruptive, a little bit of a troublemaker, but the steroids amplified those traits in his personality. So he went from being a little bit of a troublemaker, being a little bit disruptive, to now he was extremely violent and a bully. He would have these extreme mood swings. He was always very angry. And those around him said that he had roid rage, which I have never heard of that saying before, but roid is short for steroid. He would just go into these rages. But Raoul on these steroids also became extremely paranoid. He installed CCTV outside of his home and he would watch the CCTV footage constantly because he was always on edge. He always just thought that someone was out to get him. And his paranoia got so bad that he slept with a crossbow and an axe 
under his bed. And it wasn't long until Raoul fell into a life of crime. It is said that someone with Raoul's physique and also his personality, the fact that he was a bully, those kinds of people were very much in demand in the underworld in Newcastle. And Raoul became what is known as an enforcer. So as far as I'm aware, Raoul was never a part of a gang or an organization, but gangs or organizations would contact Raoul to carry out their dirty work. Basically, Raoul would go around intimidating people, beating people up for gangs. But then Raoul also did have a legal job. He was a bouncer at a nightclub. So now Raoul is 19 years old and he enters into the first relationship that we know of. And this is with a woman called Marissa Reed. And this was not a good relationship for Marissa, not at all, as you can imagine with someone like Raoul. So the pair first met in a nightclub that Raoul was the bouncer of. Marissa was also 19 and they hit it off immediately. The pair quickly started dating and in the beginning, Raoul put on his charm and he was the perfect gentleman. But did it stay like that? No, of course it didn't because with people like Raoul, they turn on the charm, they reel you in and then they show you their true colors. Because Raoul, and this was probably a side effect of the steroids, not that it's an excuse, but it probably was from the steroids. Raoul was an incredibly jealous person and that is an understatement. He was also incredibly possessive. He even said to Marissa, you're mine now. Whenever Marissa left the house, Raoul wanted to know where she was going, who she was going with, what she was wearing. And if Marissa ever went out with her friends for a night out, Raoul would insist on going with her. She was also not allowed to talk to any other men, just in a friendly way, not a flirty way. She was not even allowed to say hello to another man. But also other men were not allowed to talk to her either. And if another man did speak to Marissa, Again, not in a flirty way, just saying hello, for example. Raoul would take that man and beat him up. But the thing is, Raoul was not faithful himself, was he? Oh no, one rule for Marissa and another for him. He was having multiple affairs behind Marissa's back. He was having multiple one night stands. And Marissa soon discovered that Raoul had an obsession with underage girls. Yeah, he doesn't get much worse, does he? Apparently, Raoul would go around Newcastle and hunt for underage girls. Girls under the age of consent. And the age of consent in the UK is 16, so he is looking for girls that are 15 and under. He would go around finding these underage girls and then he would pressure them and convince them to have sex with him. And as far as I'm aware, he never faced any legal repercussions for this behavior, but that is just disgusting. But then there is one more element to the relationship between Raoul and Marissa, which is also incredibly disturbing. Raoul would physically and sexually assault Marissa. And I am gonna be talking about an incident that occurred, which is very distressing to hear. So just be aware of that. It does include sexual assault. So Raoul and Marissa, they were at a nightclub. They were having a night out when all of a sudden Marissa's friend, who happened to be a man, walked over to Marissa to say hello to her. Because of course he's going to do that. That's his friend. Why would he just ignore his friend? He's not going to, is he? So Marissa's friend, he gives Marissa a hug because they're friends. And Raoul storms over and he says, why have you got your arm around my girlfriend? He then grabs the man's arm and drags him out of the nightclub. He takes him down a side alley and he severely beats him up. Marissa is also there. She is pleading with Raoul to stop. But Raoul is a very scary person. It's almost like he gets tunnel vision and there is no getting through to him. There is no stopping him. And there are other witnesses to this beating, including bouncers, which are there to help and protect people. And the bouncers, probably because they are Raoul's friends, remember that Raoul is a bouncer, the bouncers just stand and stare, watch this happen. Marissa tries to leave because she wants to go home. But Raoul grabs her by the neck and pins her head to the floor and says to her, 
you're not going anywhere before he then drags her back into the nightclub. Marissa then spent the next two hours in the toilet of the nightclub just crying her eyes out. She was absolutely terrified about what Raoul could do to her when they got home. And then finally, once the two of them were home, Marissa tried to go upstairs. She wanted to go to bed. She wanted to try and put that night behind her. But Raoul, he was not done because Raoul burst into the bedroom and he said, if you want to be a slag, I'll treat you like one. He then grabbed a belt, which he used to bind Marissa's wrists to the bed. He then picked up another belt and viciously beat her with this belt. And then very sadly, Raoul then raped Marissa as she was tied to the bed. He really is the lowest of the low, isn't he? This was the first time that she had been raped by Raoul, but it would not be the last. She now felt completely trapped in this relationship. She was so scared to leave because Raoul would say that he would kill her. There was another time where Raoul came home and he demanded sex and Marissa said no. So Raoul pushed her face into the wall and he also smashed her head against his knee. He then threw her on the floor and pressed a baseball bat into her throat. She was unable to breathe. She actually thought that she was going to die. Somehow she managed to gather the strength and she actually managed to get out of that situation with the baseball on her throat. But then Raoul took the baseball bat and smashed it over her back into her spine. Raoul then grabbed her by the throat and started to strangle her. Marissa then blacked out from being strangled and she woke up a little bit later on and she started vomiting blood. Raoul had disappeared from the home. So Marissa managed to stagger onto the streets where a passerby saw her and helped her and called an ambulance. Marissa was rushed to hospital and thankfully she made a full recovery and she was going to press charges against Raoul. However, Raoul sent one of his cronies in to intimidate Marissa and she dropped the charges. Raoul then turned up on the hospital ward and just stood and looked at her and started lying laughing. He said to her, you look like Frank Bruno, who was a professional British boxer, by the way, if you don't know who he is. And Raoul and Marissa left the hospital together. And the relationship continued on like this. It was just so abusive. And Raoul just continued to abuse her both physically and sexually. He continued on taking steroids, which only made him worse. Marissa actually had to measure Raoul's biceps every single day. And his biceps, by the way, measured 19 and a half inches. Marissa also had to inject him with steroids. And what is just so heartbreaking is that the relationship between Raoul and Marissa lasted for nine years. In that nine year relationship, the two of them had two children, which my heart breaks for those children as well, because that is not the kind of environment that children should be in. So the first time that Marissa was pregnant, Raoul accused her of sleeping around. He also said that her baby did not deserve to be born and she should miscarry. He then threw her onto the sofa before punching her in the head, pulling out clumps of her hair and threw her into the TV whilst she is pregnant. And Marissa the whole time is pleading for her baby's life. During the second pregnancy, when Marissa was seven months pregnant, Raoul left her for a 15 year old. You heard that right. Raoul left his pregnant girlfriend for a child. At some point as well during these two pregnancies, and I'm not entirely sure which pregnancy it was, Raoul had an affair with a woman called Caroline and had a baby with her as well. Also, Raoul had other affairs during the nine year relationship and had two other children as well. So Raoul has five children. Am I counting that correctly? Yeah, five children. And I don't know the details of these other relationships, the other affairs, but I think we can all assume that the other women that he was having children with, that he was having the affairs with, they probably also were abused and victims of Raoul. However, finally, in the early 2000s, Raoul is 28 years old. He had gotten bored of Marissa and the two finally separated. 
However, Raoul said to Marissa that even though they were no longer together, Marissa was not allowed to date anyone else. He could. He was going to move on. He was about to move on to a child, but Marissa was not allowed to date. However, the nightmare for Marissa was not over. Even though the relationship was over, the nightmare was not. So now we skip to 2003. Raoul is now 30 years old. And this is when Raoul meets a pretty significant woman, or should I say girl? And this girl went by the name Samantha Stobart. And she is a very significant person to the rest of this case. So Samantha and Raoul first met in a place called Liquid Nightclub in Newcastle. So Raoul was working as a bouncer and Samantha was visiting the nightclub. Now, Samantha is only 15. So I don't really know what the situation was. Like, was she using a fake ID? Like, was she getting into the nightclub underage? Or in the UK, and I'm sure this happens in other countries, so you'll have to let me know. But in the UK, nightclubs do host teenage events, but it allows teenagers, underage people to go out to a nightclub and have a good time with their friends in a safe environment. And I just want to stress that I don't know if this is true okay but it does kind of make sense that Raoul would want to be a bouncer at one of those teenage events wouldn't it because he is obsessed with teenage girls it is a perfect hunting ground for him but like I said I don't know if that is true but it does make sense so I don't know which one of the two Samantha is going to but anyway Samantha is 15 years old and Raoul is a bouncer at this nightclub and he is 30 30 and she is 15. Raoul meets Samantha at this nightclub and Raoul is very confident. He puts on the charm and Samantha is only 15. She is in awe of Raoul. She is thinking, oh my God, this older man is interested in me. She's flattered. And the two of them arrange to meet up. And I just want to stress again, she is 15. And Raoul seems to string Samantha along for a little bit. And then as soon as Samantha turns 16, they officially start dating. You know, she's just hit that age of consent so no one can get prosecuted. And this is just grooming, 100% grooming. I don't care if Samantha is 16 and she is at the age of consent it is still not okay. The two of them start dating. Samantha is spending more and more time with Raoul. Samantha's family are not too happy about this. I mean, of course they're not. And her family try and keep her away from Raoul, but Samantha's just not listening. She right now doesn't see the flaws in Raoul. She thinks that he's amazing. He's so charming. He treats her well. But then of course, just like the relationship with Marissa, once Raoul had his grasp on Samantha, Raoul's mask started to fall and he starts to be jealous, possessive and abusive all over again. Raoul would try and keep Samantha away from her friends and family. He wanted to isolate her. He wanted Samantha to feel like there was nowhere else to go. She was on her own. Samantha was also never allowed to talk to any men. And whenever Samantha disobeyed him, he would turn incredibly violent. There was one occasion where he split her head open because he threw her into a wall. Another time he jumped on her stomach. There were occasions where Samantha would flee Raoul. She wanted to get away from him and she would escape to a friend's house or a family member's house. But Raoul would always hunt her down. There was one time where she was hiding out at her sister's house and Raoul came round and just smashed his way into the house. He smashed a window. There was another time where Samantha was hiding out at her grandmother's house and Raoul turned up with a gun. And the time that he turned up at her grandmother's house with a gun, he did this because Samantha had posted on Facebook that she was going out with a friend. And of course, that is not allowed. So he turned up at her grandmother's house and he started shouting, I know you've got a man in here. I know you've got a man in here. And Samantha's grandmother said that she would call the police. However, Raoul said, okay, if you call the police, I will just shoot them as well. And um, Raoul's dislike for the police is actually really significant in today's case. So the police were not called because her grandmother was scared about what 
could possibly happen. And every single time, Samantha would always go back to Raul because that was the only way to calm down the situation. So this relationship with Samantha does become long-term. And two years later, when Samantha is 18, she gives birth to a child. But it was also around this time in 2006, Raul is currently 33 years old, that Marissa comes back into the story in the most heartbreaking of ways. So if you remember, he does have two children with Marissa, two daughters, and they are currently aged five and seven. And right now the children live full time with Marissa and Raul sees them on the weekends. But now that he's just had another child, another daughter with Samantha, he starts to think to himself, you know what? I like this family lifestyle. I want all of my children living with me. Well, not all of his children because we obviously know he has other children, but he's specifically talking about the children that he has with Marissa. So Raul essentially kidnaps his own children from Marissa. So on the weekend when the two children are visiting, he refuses to give them back. And Raul tells Marissa that the children are now living with him and there is nothing she can do about it. When you hear that, it's like, how can he just do that? The children are living full time with Marissa. How can he literally just take them? Surely the authorities can do something. However, Raul had a plan for that. Raul had started to brainwash his children against their own mother. He would ply them with treats and gifts and toys, and he would tell them how much of a bad person their mother was. He told them that Marissa, their mother was a criminal. She was a drug dealer. She had guns in the house and that she had been violent to Raoul. Uh -huh. Yeah, you heard that right. She was the violent one. And then to just top everything off, Raoul took his two daughters down to the police station and told his daughters to repeat those lies to police officers. And the two daughters told the police that Marissa abused them, that she hit them multiple times with a spatula, that their mom would carry a shotgun around the house. They also said that there was one occasion where their mother stabbed their father with a knife. And the officers that were listening to the two girls asked them, when did this happen? Where did you hear this from? And the two of them would just say, well, daddy told me. So the police officers could see what was going on. They could see, uh, okay. So thankfully no charges were brought against Marissa because the police officers could see that it was a bunch of lies. However, Raoul did not stop. Raoul would make numerous calls to social services telling them that Marissa was neglecting her children. He even called the RSPCA and told them that she had abused their dog. He also made an anonymous call to the police and said that he had seen a shotgun in the house and a pile of cocaine. And the anonymous caller had also overheard Marissa telling somebody that she was going to murder a man called Raoul Moat. So of course the police had to take this call seriously. So the police storm over to Marissa's house, but there was no shotgun, there was no cocaine, and the police realized it was all a hoax. So Raoul told Marissa that if she tried to get her children back, he would kill her. And Marissa believed him because look at what he is capable of. Look at what she had to go through for nine years. But Marissa also thought that he was capable of murdering their children. So in that moment, she thought the best thing to do was to let her children live with Raoul. Marissa just watched from afar as Raoul literally stole her children. So Raoul and Samantha's relationship continues, but it just goes downhill and downhill even further. Because at this point in Raoul's life, he had continued to get in trouble with the police. Like I said, this whole stuff with the police is very significant to today's case. So currently Raoul was also working part-time as a tree surgeon, as well as a bouncer, and as well as an enforcer to the underworld. But anyway, as he is working as a tree surgeon, Surgeon, Raoul got his work van confiscated by the police because it was found that he was carrying materials that he didn't have a license for, which is not the worst thing in the world. It's like, okay. But then on top of this, Raoul was also caught carrying a knuckle duster and a samurai sword, which is obviously way more serious. Then there was another occasion where Raoul was accused of attempted murder, which 
I 100% believe it was probably just another street fight, but we all know that Raoul is definitely capable of murder. Now, in the end, he was never convicted of anything to do with any of those charges or any of the run-ins with the police. Raoul ended up losing his job as a bouncer because of the run-ins with the police. And Raoul blamed the police for this, not his own behavior, not his own law breaking. Oh no, no, no. It was the police's fault for catching him. Raoul never takes responsibility for his own actions. No, it's always someone else's fault. Never Raoul, never perfect Raoul. And then there continued to be problems at home. Raoul continued to abuse Samantha physically and sexually. He would quite often come home and force himself on her. And Raoul was also intimidating and a bully and an abuser to his children. Apparently there was one time as punishment, he made one of his daughters stand outside, outside of the house with a sign around her neck that said naughty. And thankfully he did get in trouble with social services for this. And then this next thing is just like, what the hell, this is disgusting. There was another time and I don't know if it's the same daughter, I'm not sure. One of his daughters stole food from the house, which is like, did she steal food or did she just take food and she wasn't allowed? I feel like stole food from the house is a bit extreme when it's your own house. But he punished her by tying her to a chair and he left her there overnight. Again, thankfully, he got in trouble with social services for this. And I just feel like, um, shouldn't the children be taken off him at this point? Maybe returned to their mother, Marissa? It's ridiculous. It really is. Some people are given way too many chances, especially when it comes to children. There was another incident where his two-year-old daughter accidentally fell out of a window. Thankfully, I think the two-year-old didn't suffer any injuries because I think it was a lower ground window. Oh God, I need to give a warning for animal abuse right now. Raoul also got in trouble with the authorities because he beat up the family dog in front of his children as punishment because one of the children had misbehaved. And sadly, the dog sustained very, very serious injuries. And the dog was not taken to a vet. And sadly, heartbreakingly, the dog died two days later from its injuries. It literally gets no worse than this man. It really doesn't. He beats up random people in the street. He beats up and sexually abuses his partners. He's also abusive to his children. And now he's abusing animals. And unbelievably, Raoul just kept getting away with all of this. Yes, he got in trouble, but he pretty much just got a slap on the wrist. However, this was all about to change. He did something so horrific that social services had to intervene and investigate because he physically assaulted his nine-year-old daughter. Now the details around this assault are not actually known, so I can't tell you what happened, but we know some of the abuse and the assaults that he has committed to his children and to others, and he has never faced any prison time. So that does lead me to believe that it is something a little bit more serious because the police got involved and he was charged and sentenced Thank God he is finally going to prison. However, he was only sentenced to 18 weeks. However, there was something good that came out of him going to prison and that is Marissa's two children were finally taken off him and returned to her. So after four years, Marissa has finally gotten her children back. And I feel so bad for Marissa, I really do, because it was one of her children that he assaulted. The nine-year-old was her child and I can just imagine she probably blamed herself, but there is no one to blame here but Raoul. And you might be thinking, finally, at least he's in prison. This is a good thing, but unfortunately it's not. Um, it's not. Raoul going to prison would actually trigger off a catastrophic chain of events that would soon end in the biggest manhunt in British history. So Raoul goes to prison in early 2010 and Samantha sees this as her chance to escape. She can take her daughter and get out. So she is brave and she calls up Raoul, who is in prison, and she tells him it's over, which Raoul, of course, didn't take very well, but we will return to that. And soon after Samantha made this call, Samantha ends up meeting a new man, 
by the name of Christopher Brown. So Christopher Brown, who went by Chris, he was born in Windsor, but he kind of lived and grew up in Slough. And after leaving school, he went on to find work as a karate instructor. He has been described by friends as very popular, just like a really friendly guy. He was always up for a good time. He loved to party. And when he was the age 28, he fancied a fresh start. He just wanted something different, something new. So he moved from like the London area and he moved to Newcastle and he wanted to set up his own business as a karate instructor. And less than a year after he moved to Newcastle, Chris bumped in to Samantha. And there was just like instant chemistry. There was just like that instant spark. They exchanged numbers, they went on a couple of dates and within a week, Samantha was completely smitten by Chris. Because you know what? Chris was a good guy. He treated her well, he treated her with respect. It was a totally different experience dating Chris than it was Raoul. However, there was one problem. And that was Raoul. Because we know Raoul is a very possessive, very jealous person. And do we really think that he is going to allow Samantha to move on? No, of course he's not. He will never allow Samantha to be happy. So even though they were no longer together, Raoul would still call Samantha every single day from prison. And Samantha was absolutely terrified because she knew how violent Raoul could be. And right now, Raoul doesn't know about her new boyfriend. And Samantha is absolutely terrified because he is in prison right now, but he will get out. What is she supposed to do then when he gets out? he will find out. So Samantha is so brave and she decides that she needs to tackle this situation head on. And she decides that she needs to go and visit Raoul in person. She needs to see him in person and tell him once and for all that it's over. She needs to tell him that she has a new boyfriend. So Samantha turns up at the prison and Raoul, he starts off by being charming because he wants her back. He's like, Samantha, I want you back. I want things to work. I'll be different. But Samantha remains firm. She's like, no, I told you it was over and it is over. She also tells him that she's moved on, that she has found somebody else. And as you can imagine, Raoul, he pretty much lost it. Now, Samantha didn't tell Raoul the new boyfriend's name, but she did tell Raoul that he was a karate instructor because she was really hoping that this would be intimidating to Raoul. But then she also said one other very significant thing. She also said to Raoul that her new boyfriend was a police officer, which of course, Chris was not a police officer, but Samantha thought that this was possibly the only thing that she could say to Raoul that would scare him off. Because surely Raoul, being a very violent bully and an abuser, surely he wouldn't come after a police officer. However, it actually had the complete opposite effect. Raoul became enraged that his girlfriend, because he still saw Samantha as his, that his girlfriend was now dating a police officer. And Raoul blames the police for everything, doesn't he? Well, now he was also blaming the police for taking away his girlfriend. Samantha left the prison and she was really hoping that she could just put this whole situation behind her, but that was sadly not the case. Raoul was not about to let this go. So on the 1st of July, 2010, Raoul Mote is released from prison. And as you can imagine, there was only one thing on his mind and that was revenge. Now, running up to his release from prison after Samantha's visit, Raoul was overheard talking to other inmates that he was going to get revenge on his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend who was a police officer. And the prison were made aware that Raoul could possibly pose a threat to his ex-girlfriend. And a report was filed. However, sadly, this report would not be looked at until it was too late. So Raoul is out of prison and he posts on Facebook. Just got out of jail. I've lost everything. My business, my property. And to top it all off, my lass of six years has gone off with the copper that sent me down. I'm not 21 and I can't rebuild my life. 
see what happens. Could he make it more obvious that he is going to be a threat to people? So on Rao's very first night out of prison, he gets a couple of his friends and they pretty much go searching for Samantha's new boyfriend. And because Rao knows that her new boyfriend is also a karate instructor, he locates a karate gym that is nearby to try and find him. And they search the local area for this karate instructor police officer but they don't find him. So Raoul heads back home and starts working on a different plan. This is when he asks one of his mates, a man named Carl Ness, to source a gun for him. Carl manages to get Raoul a gun. Next, Raoul is seen on CCTV going shopping in B&Q. He is literally seen on CCTV buying supplies. And then later that night, just one day after he is released from prison, he starts to put his plan in motion. And it is really crazy when you realize that he has only been out of prison for just over 24 hours. So on Friday, the 2nd of July, 2010, Samantha and Chris had gone out for the evening. They had gone out for a few drinks and Samantha's mom, Leslie, was looking after Samantha's daughter. Now this was something that Leslie always did. She always looked after her granddaughter, especially right now because she's finally seeing her daughter in a healthy relationship. Her daughter is finally happy. So Leslie was more than happy to look after her granddaughter. However, there was somebody that knew where Samantha's mom lived and that was Raoul. Because Raoul, he was looking for Samantha. He didn't know where she was living at the time. It didn't take too long to put together that Samantha was probably living with her mom. So Raoul decided to basically hide out outside of Samantha's mom's house in the hopes that Samantha will show up. So it is just after midnight now. So it is now the 3rd of July and Samantha and Chris return back to Samantha's mom's house. However, Samantha's mom is not actually home. She's gone over to a neighbor's house who is a woman called Jackie Wilkinson. And Jackie was really close with the family. Leslie and Samantha were always over at Jackie's house. So this wasn't unusual. And Samantha's daughter was also at the neighbor's house. So Samantha and Chris were like, okay, let's go over to the neighbor's house. And Samantha and Chris, they go into Jackie's house and they decide to stay for a little bit. They have a few drinks. Samantha's daughter is asleep upstairs and everything is great. Everyone's happy. Everyone's had a good night. But Raoul Moat is watching them and he creeps over to Jackie's house and he crouches down under a window and Raoul is literally listening to everything that is going on in that house. But everyone inside the house was completely clueless that Raoul was there. And as Raoul was listening to the conversations that were going on, he was becoming so angry because he could hear that Samantha was happy. But also there were a few bad words exchanged about Raoul. You know, they were having a little bit of a gossip. They were saying some not nice things about Raoul, but to be honest, he deserves it. And Raoul was texting his mates and he was saying, Samantha deserves to be punished. Samantha had betrayed him. And after a couple of hours, the night has wound down and Samantha and Chris decide to leave. Now, Samantha decides that she's just gonna leave her daughter where she is because her daughter's asleep. She doesn't wanna disturb her. So Samantha and Chris leave Jackie's house. And this was at 2.40 a.m. Samantha and Chris, they walk down the front garden path and they get to like a grassy field area outside of the house. And this is when Raoul makes his appearance. He literally just pops up out of nowhere. He has been sat under that window the whole time. And Chris and Samantha see Raoul and he is holding a sawn off shotgun. And Samantha, I can just imagine all the blood like leaving her body, the state of panic, the feeling in her stomach. Samantha shouted to Chris, that's Raoul, that's Raoul. But everything happened so quickly and Raoul pointed his shotgun at Chris and pulled the trigger. He shot Chris and it hit him in the legs, making Chris fall to the ground. Samantha made a move to help Chris, but before she could do anything, Raoul had already reloaded the gun and he pulled the trigger again, this time shooting Chris in the back. Samantha started screaming. She knew that Raoul was going to kill Chris, probably also kill her. And she had only one thought in her mind, and that was her four-year-old daughter. Her four-year-old daughter that was still asleep in the house right by them. Samantha 
runs to the house. Raoul raises his gun to shoot Samantha, but he needs to reload, giving Samantha time to escape. And whilst he was reloading, Samantha manages to get to the house and shut the door. Now, Jackie and Leslie, so the family friend and Samantha's mom, they have realized what is going on. Leslie, the grandmother, runs up to her granddaughter, bundles her up and actually takes her to the attic to protect her and to keep her safe. Because I think everyone in that house right now thinks that Raoul is going to kill his daughter. That little girl is everyone's priority right now. And then Jackie is obviously her house. She's trying to find the keys to lock the door. But in the state of panic, she can't find the keys. She can't lock the door, even though, let's be realistic, what is a locked door going to do against Raoul? But she's obviously just trying to keep everyone safe. Samantha, who was in such a state of shock, she went into the living room and looked out of the living room window to look at Chris. And as Samantha is looking out at Chris, wondering, is he still alive? Can I help him? Raoul goes back over to Chris and he points the shotgun at point blank range and shoots Chris in the head. Christopher Brown has now sadly lost his life and Samantha knows that there is nothing she can do for him. Samantha started screaming and crying and Raoul turns around and looks at Samantha. He can see that she's standing there in the living room window. He reloads his gun. He points his shotgun at Samantha and pulls the trigger. The window shattered instantly and Samantha felt like the breath had been taken out of her body. At first, she didn't realize that she had been shot, but she had. Shotgun pellets had torn through her arm, into her stomach, and also reached her spine. Jackie managed to get Samantha and pull her into the kitchen to safety away from the window. And Jackie started to apply pressure to the wound, but she knew that at any moment, Raoul could walk through the front door, which is still unlocked. Jackie and probably everyone in that house in that moment thought, we're all gonna die. But out of nowhere, Samantha's mother, Leslie, came running down the stairs. She had obviously just put her granddaughter in the attic. She came running down the stairs, went out of the front door. She starts running at Raoul and she started screaming at Raoul, you shot my baby, shoot me instead, you bastard. So Raoul turned his gun on Leslie. But at that exact moment, Leslie's husband, Paul, who they only lived a few doors down, Paul could hear what was going on and Paul came running out of the house, saw that Raoul was pointing a shotgun at his wife. He starts making his way to Raoul and he starts saying, oh no you don't, no you don't. And Raoul saw that Paul was making his way towards him. And in that moment, it's almost like Raoul woke up. His expression on his face just changed. Because before he had this murderous cold stare in his eyes. But in that moment, Raoul, you could see in his eyes, he started to panic. He had finally realized what he was doing and he turned around and ran away. And I think it's very clear that Raoul probably would have shot Leslie in that moment if it wasn't for Paul. And then I think it's very safe to assume that he would have gone into that house and God knows what he would have done. But Raoul has still taken an innocent life. Christopher Brown, and he has seriously injured his ex-girlfriend, Samantha. So after the whole shooting, a lot of things happen at pretty much the same time. So Samantha gets rushed to hospital and thankfully she survived. She had suffered terrible injuries. And it is said that if her hand was not in front of her stomach at the time she was shot, she might not be here. But because her arm was in the way, it took most of the blast. And the police obviously launched their investigation. They know who they're looking for. They take statements from everyone involved and the manhunt for Raoul Mo begins. And this is a matter of urgency because he has a shotgun that he is not afraid to use. He has already killed one person and severely injured another. So where was Raoul Moat? Well, remember when he went to B&Q? He had bought a load of camping supplies and he was planning on hiding out in the wilderness, in the woods somewhere. But Raoul was not on his own. No, he had a couple of sidekicks. So his first sidekick was a man called Carl Ness. 
Do you remember him? Carl Ness was the one that supplied the shotgun. The other sidekick was a man called Kurum Arwan. And Kurum actually supplied the getaway car. Mm -hmm. So all three of them are just camping out, hiding out. And the police have no idea where Raoul is. So now we get to Saturday the 3rd of July, which is technically the next day, but also technically not because obviously all of that attack happened in the early hours. But anyway, we get to later on on Saturday the 3rd of July. And Samantha is in hospital and somehow Raoul manages to find out what hospital Samantha is in and he sends her a get well soon card. And oh my God, that would have been terrifying if you were Samantha. To receive that card, it's almost threatening. He wanted to make Samantha feel like he was watching her, that she would never be free of him. But the whole day passes, the whole of Saturday, and the police have no idea where he is. And then at 11.30 p.m. on Saturday the 3rd of July, Raoul turns up at one of his friend's house. And this person is Andy McAllister. So Andy had been watching the news all day because Raoul's face was everywhere. Every news channel, Raoul's face was there. And then all of a sudden, Raoul turns up at his door. I can imagine he was probably terrified. Andy tries to convince Raoul to hand himself in, give it up, it's not worth it. But Raoul is like, no, no, it's too late. I've got nothing to lose. Raoul asks Andy for a mobile phone so he can speak to the police and then he leaves. It is just after midnight now on the 4th of July and Raoul makes a very cold, chilling phone call. This is the gunman from Bertley last night. My name is Raoul Moore. Now my girlfriend, she's having a affair with one of your officers. Was he the police officer? I wouldn't have shot him. You police have took too much off me over the years. In the phone call, he basically said that his ex-girlfriend had an affair with a police officer. He also says that the police have taken far too much for him over the years and it was unfair. The police are out to get him and now they've taken his girlfriend. He also said that if Chris wasn't a police officer, he would never have shot him. He also said on the phone call that he has two hostages with him and he's not afraid to kill them. So do what he wants. I've got two hostages at the minute, right? Come anywhere near me, I'll kill them as well. Which obviously he doesn't have hostages with him. They're actually his friends. He's just trying to use them as leverage. Following this, Raoul also says that he's not coming in alive. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not coming in alive. Hey, come anywhere near me, I'll kill you. And this is basically when Raoul declares war on the police, saying that he's going to take them all out. He's going to take as many with him as possible. I'm coming to get you, I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. Raoul then puts the phone down and bloody hell, I can't even imagine being the call handler on that phone call because you don't exactly get that kind of call every day, do you? But this is now when we move on to the next tragedy of the case because Raoul comes across PC David Rathband. So PC David Rathband had grown up in Stafford. He was married with two children. And for the last 10 years, he had been working as a traffic officer for the Northumbria police. And this was a job that he absolutely loved. And at 12.45 a.m. in the early hours of of Sunday the 4th of July. PC David Rathband was in his police car and he was stationary near a roundabout and he was just waiting for any calls that might come in and he was currently texting his wife. Now his wife was very concerned because she knew that there was a gunman on the loose and she told her husband to be careful and David replied and said that he would. And then moments later, literally as the pair had just finished texting, a strange man started jogging over to David. And at first David didn't know what was going on, but then the person stopped at the passenger side window, pulled out a shotgun, placed it on the window and pulled the trigger. Immediately a huge blast rang out. The noise was so deafening in that car and 200 pieces of shotgun blasts were discharged directly at David's face. The pain was excruciating. David felt like his face had literally exploded. The pellets had also hit David directly in the eyes. But incredibly, David was still alive. David made a move to call for help, but Raoul was not done. He could see that David was still alive, so he pulled the trigger 
Again, this time the blast hit David in the shoulder and threw him back. Again, David was still alive. However, in that moment, David realized that Raoul was not going to stop until he was dead. So David decided to play dead. He stopped moving. He stopped breathing. And Raoul thought that he had killed David, so he left. And as soon as he had left, David gathered the willpower, because he was in so much pain, he gathered all of his strength to call for help. Emergency services made their way to him immediately. He was rushed to hospital and they didn't think that he was going to make it. David told the paramedics to tell his wife and his children that he loved them. But amazingly, even though he had 200 shotgun pieces in his face, he survived. However, because the blast did hit David directly in the eyes, from this moment forward, David would now be permanently blind. So following the shooting, Raoul goes on the run again. And pretty much immediately, he calls the police and confesses to killing a police officer. He also complains that the police are not taking him seriously enough. But the police are taking him seriously. They really are trying to find him, but he is nowhere to be seen. However, Raoul turns up at his friend Andy's house again. And by the way, Andy had not informed the police that Raoul had already visited him. But anyway, Raoul hands Andy a letter and he tells Andy that he wants this letter to be handed to the police and also the press. And this letter was 49 pages. It was an essay and I do not know how Raoul somehow managed to find the time to write this letter. In this letter, it was basically a confession and it basically said his motive behind what he was doing, but you know Raoul, he likes to play the victim. He kept repeating in the letter that he had nothing to lose. The police had taken everything from him. Everything was the police's fault and they were going to pay. He also did blame Samantha for driving him to this. He basically blamed everyone but himself. Because you know, Raoul is not responsible for his own actions. No, he's not the one with a shotgun. He also repeats his commitment to hunt down police officers. So after he leaves Andy's house, Andy finally calls the police. He tells them that Raoul has been to his home and he also says that he has a letter to hand to them. So we are now two days into the manhunt. I think the police were probably thinking that they would have Raoul in custody by now. So they now realize that they need to give protection to Raoul's potential victims. So obviously Samantha is already under protection. I assume the rest of her family are as well. But this also included Raoul's ex-partners like Marissa and her two children. And then not too long after this, Raoul posted on Facebook his hit list. And it's just like, oh my God, how are the police not able to track him down? He's literally posting on Facebook. But there was a few people on this hit list, which included Samantha and Samantha's sister and pretty much all of Samantha's family. And oh my God, that would be terrifying. Imagine Raoul, who is literally loose with a shotgun, posting on Facebook a hit list and seeing your own name. So now we skip forward another day. So it is now Monday, the 5th of July. We are on day three of the manhunt. Police at this point are making huge appeals to the public for their help. They are giving out descriptions of Raoul. Samantha also gives a statement saying that this madness needs to end. But Raoul doesn't listen. Of course he doesn't. He doesn't care one bit. He's on a mission. He's focused. Like I said, he has tunnel vision sometimes. And after this press conference on Monday, Raoul just casually strolls in to a fish and chip shop and holds the owner at gunpoint and demands all the money from the shop. Yeah, Raoul is now committing armed robbery. But when police arrive at the scene, Raoul is already gone. So now we get to Tuesday, the 6th of July, day four of the manhunt. It is a matter of urgency that the police find Raoul because he is only getting more dangerous. So anyway, on Tuesday, on the fourth day of the manhunt, the police finally get a lead. They find out that Raoul is traveling in a black Lexus and they also have the registration 
registration number. So they put these details out to the public. And finally, a member of the public phones in because they have spotted the car. So the police truly thought, we've got Raoul, we have him. They rush to the scene where the black Lexus is parked. And the black Lexus is parked near like a woodland park area and the police get a helicopter to fly over to look at the scene and the helicopter spots two males hanging around outside of a tent. They are really hoping that one of those males is Raoul Mote, but then they also think that the other male must be an innocent hostage. So armed police officers make their way over. However, the tent is empty. Then police spot two males walking away from the tent and they are on foot on a nearby road. Again, the police are so convinced that this is Raoul Mote and he heard the police and now he's trying to escape. So multiple police cars rush to these two males on foot on the nearby road. They literally circle them. They enclose them so they can't move. They throw tear gas at the ground to disable the two males because they think it's Raoul Mote. They think he has a shotgun and they pin the two men to the ground. However, neither one of the two males, neither one of them is Raoul Mote. The police have actually caught the two sidekicks of Raoul Mote. But at this moment, the police think that these two men are innocent hostages. The police search the nearby area, but Raoul is nowhere to be seen. They then go back to the tent and search it, and they come across a dictaphone. And we all know that Raoul loves to talk. Raoul had rambled on for four hours on this dictaphone. I feel sorry for the person that had to listen to those four hours. He was just going on and on and on and on about himself, about how he is the victim in all of this. Like it didn't have to come to this. It's the police's fault. Why are they targeting me so much? Meanwhile, the police have taken the two innocent hostages in for questioning. Now the police are suspicious of the two of them pretty much from the get-go. Something just feels off. They also find out that the black Lexus that Raoul has been traveling in actually belongs to Curum, and it doesn't take investigators long to figure out that these two men they are not hostages. Oh no, they're actually Raoul Mote's friends. And oh my God, this is so stupid. So Curum wrote a letter to his sister. He actually wrote two letters to his sister. One letter was, I've been taken hostage. I'm in danger, blah, blah, blah. But then the other letter said, hi sister, don't worry about me. I'm not actually a hostage. I'm just with Raoul Mo. I'm helping him out on a few things that he wants to do burn this letter after you've read it. But his sister didn't burn the letter. Thank God she didn't. So both Carl and Karam are arrested for being accomplices to Raoul Moat. So now Raoul doesn't have his sidekicks with him. The police are really hoping that they are one step closer to catching him. Now the manhunt enters into its fifth day. And this is where things start to get a lot more serious for the police because the dictaphone that they found in the tent, he had rambled on for four hours, but in those four hours, Raoul had made a very chilling threat. Raoul was getting very angry at the press because obviously this was a huge story. The press were really running with this and they were printing pretty much any information that they could find, whether it was true or not. A lot of the newspapers, they just didn't care. They just wanted to sell newspapers and the newspapers were kind of taking the mick out of Raoul. They were saying that he had a small penis and that is why he was doing what he was doing. It's like, why does that even have anything to do with this? I don't know. But again, that is a tabloid newspaper for you. Another newspaper also printed that Raoul's own mother had said that Raoul would be better off dead, which I don't know if that is true or not. I don't know. There was also another newspaper that said that Raoul liked to dress in women's clothing and put on makeup. And Raoul on the dictaphone had said that he was getting really angry with all of these lies in the paper. And that if the press didn't stop printing lies about him, he was going to kill an innocent member of the public. For every lie I see in that paper, or any paper, I'm going to kill an innocent member of the public. And this was pretty much the worst thing that the police could hear. Because up until this moment, the police had a pretty good idea 
who the targeted victims could be. And therefore, they could protect those potential victims. But now, Raoul is threatening pretty much anyone in the public. How do you protect everyone? How do you protect everyone from a man that disappears into the night? And the police knew that it really was urgent now that they find Raoul Mo. I mean, it was urgent before, but now they had no more time to lose. This could potentially turn into one of the biggest disasters in British history. So at this point, the manhunt goes into overdrive. I mean, it was already pretty big, but this is where it goes crazy. This is where it becomes the biggest manhunt the UK has ever seen. So 160 armed police officers were deployed. And just to put that into perspective, that is 10% of the entire UK armed officers. There were also thousands of police officers deployed in the area as well. But not just that, they had sniper teams, they had helicopters, sniffer dogs, armoured anti-terrorist vehicles, and they also had RAF fighter jets. It's like the RAF, what the hell? On top of all of that, they also recruited the celebrity survival expert and tracker Ray Mears because he had a lot of skills on how to track someone in a woodland area and that is exactly what they needed. Now the search had been narrowed down to a small village just north of Newcastle. It's actually very close to the Scottish border, which is the village of Rothbury. Now around Rothbury is a lot of woodland area and the police had learned from family and friends of Raoul that Raoul loved being outdoors. He spent so much time in the woods and he also spent so much time in the woods around Rothbury and he was also convinced that he would be able to survive forever outdoors. So the police put the whole village of Rothbury into lockdown. They put a cordon around the village. No one was allowed in or out. The residents of the village were also told that they were not allowed to leave the house unless it's an emergency. You're in lockdown, you're not allowed to leave the house, and you know that there is a madman with a gun loose in your village. He has also declared that he wants to kill an innocent member of the public. Oh my god, I feel so sorry for those people in the village of Rothbury. There was also a £10,000 reward offered up to anyone that could give any information that led to the capture of Raoul Mo. Police were going door to door to pretty much every house in Rothbury searching for Raoul. And that was day five of the manhunt. And then it turned into day six of the manhunt. And this is when a very disappointing twist comes to the story. Because the longer the case went on, more and more people actually started showing support for Raoul. Yeah, yeah, you heard that right. People actually think that Raoul Moat was a hero. What? I am just speechless. Like, what the hell? The people that supported Raoul Moat thought that he was the victim, that he had a hard life, and he was a legend. You know, he was a legend for going after the police. Raoul Moat also became the number one trending topic on Twitter. People also started creating Facebook groups in support of Raoul Moat, and these groups had tens of thousands of members and likes. It's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. How do so many people think that Raoul Moat is the victim? How do so many people support him? It just blows my mind. He has killed an innocent person. He has shot and seriously injured his ex-girlfriend. He has shot and seriously injured a police officer. He has posted a hit list of innocent people on his Facebook. He has declared war on the police and that he wants to kill as many police officers as possible. And he has also said that he wants to kill an innocent member of the public. Please tell me what is there to support. But anyway, back to the manhunt. When is this ever gonna end? Because we're on day six right now. Well, it was on day six of the manhunt that a TV news reporter was in the village of Rothbury because there was obviously a lot of media in the village of Rothbury. And she was just walking on the street. She was probably walking back to a hotel that she was staying at and she passed a man in a hoodie. And as she passed this man, the man looked at her dead in the eye and said, hello, and then walked straight past her. Literally, it was just a second passing on the street. And the news reporter thought to herself, that face, 
that face is familiar. And then literally it clicked. That was Raoul Moat. It is unbelievable how cocky he is. This is the biggest manhunt that the UK has ever seen. And he is just walking around the bloody village. Now I want to believe that the police were doing everything that they could to catch Raoul Moat. But when you hear that, that Raoul Moat was just walking down the street in the village, it kind of makes you question, how well are the police doing their job here? But anyway, the news reporter phoned the police but by the time the police got there, Raoul was nowhere to be seen. He just seems to disappear. However, this did confirm to the police that he was in the village of Rothbury. So even though he had slipped through the cracks once again, at least they knew where he was. So now we enter day seven of the manhunt. And it really is shocking, isn't it, that the technology and the expertise and how many officers have been deployed, that they still haven't found him in a small village in seven days. However, after seven whole days of being on the run, the police find Raoul Mote sitting in a field just outside of the woodland area. And it's just crazy that he had to reveal himself to the police. I just wonder how long it would have taken the police to actually find him. Raoul is sitting in this field. I think he's figured out that the game is up. He has nowhere else to run, but there was still one problem. Raoul still had his shotgun and he had that shotgun pointing at his own head. Now the police wanted to take Raoul in alive because they wanted answers and they also wanted justice for the victims. But this was an incredibly tense situation and now there is a huge standoff. So Raoul is first spotted in the field at 7 p.m. And this whole thing, Raoul being in the field was being picked up by news helicopters. So it was being broadcast on the news. If you were following this case and you were watching the news, you were able to follow this moment by moment. Within 30 minutes, the police had an expert negotiator there and they were trying to convince Raoul that he should think of his children, that he should hand himself in, that he could rebuild his life, that it's not over. They also gave him food and water because he hadn't eaten anything really in days. And 7 p.m. turned into 8 p.m and then it turned into 9 p.m., then it turned into 10 p.m., and the negotiator wasn't really getting anywhere. And Raoul just kept saying that there was no way out of this. There was no way out. And now another twist comes into this story because Paul Gascoigne shows up. Yeah, and it's like, what the bloody hell? So for those of you that don't know who Paul Gascoigne is, he was a professional footballer and he played for England during the 80s and 90s, but he's probably become more famous after playing football due to his personal life. He has had a lot of struggles. He deals with addictions, uh, both alcohol and drugs, and he's definitely in and out of the news quite a lot. And on the 9th of July, 2010, Paul Gascoigne was in his home and he was watching the news like everyone else. And he thought to himself, you know what? I can help. Apparently he had just taken a load of cocaine and also drank a lot of alcohol. And Paul Gascoigne goes down to the scene where Raoul Moat is. Paul Gascoigne had brought with him a can of lager, chicken, a fishing rod, and a dressing gown. Very weird combination of items, but okay. He said to the police that he was Raoul Moat's brother, which obviously he wasn't. And there was no way the police were going to let this celebrity footballer anywhere near Raoul Moat. Paul Gascoigne went home and the next day he woke up and he had no memory of what he had done. But what I find weird is that Paul Gascoigne played a very small role in this case, but it's probably one of the things that most people remember about the case of Raoul Moat. So back at the standoff, things are getting more and more tense as the hours are going by and the police really do think that Raoul Moat doesn't want to get out of this alive. They are worried that he is either going to turn the gun on himself or turn the gun on the police and try and commit suicide by cop. And then it gets to 12 minutes past one in the morning. And this is where things take a very drastic turn because Raoul Moat says that there's no way out of this. And he takes the shotgun and he places it on his temple. And this is when the police desperately try to intervene to make sure that they can bring him in alive. They fire two taser cartridges at Raoul from a stun gun to try and like hit his hand to try and stop him from pulling the trigger. However, it's too late and Raoul Moat pulled the trigger. At 1.12 a.m., Raoul Moat had shot himself in the temple. He had taken his own life and now the biggest manhunt that the UK has ever seen that cost over £1 million 
had come to an end. So because Raoul had taken his own life, there was obviously no trial for Raoul. So instead there was a large inquest held and this inquest dived into the questions was there more that could have been done? Was there a more effective way to possibly bring Raoul Moat in alive? Was there any failures in the system? Why did it even take so long to find Raoul Moat in the first place? But after the inquest, there was a trial for the two sidekicks of Raoul Moat, Carl Ness and Kurum Arwen, because they had played a pretty significant role. I mean, Carl, he got the shotgun. If he never got the shotgun, none of this would have happened. And Kurum was the one that supplied the car. He was the one that was driving the all around. And Carl Ness was sentenced to three life sentences with a minimum of 40 years to be served in prison. And Kurum Arwen was sentenced to two life sentences with a minimum of 20 years to be served in prison. So obviously they are both still in prison to this very day. But unbelievably, even in the aftermath of this case, Raoul Moat still has supporters. There were RIP RAL groups on Facebook that had to be taken down. People would leave flowers in the field where Raoul Moat was, where he took his own life. How is Raoul the one that should be celebrated and remembered? How is he the victim? No, 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 that is not what we're going to do. No. Raoul Moat was a violent, abusive bully. He was manipulative. He was narcissistic. He liked to play the victim. He liked to make everything about himself and he never once ever thought about anyone else. He thought that the world was against him. He thought that the police were against him when the only person that is to blame and responsible for his actions were himself. But finally, I want to end this video focusing on the victims of this case because they are who matter in this video. Christopher Brown was described as a happy, cheerful and friendly young man. He loved fishing. He loved hanging out with his mates. He loved karate. He loved his family, especially his mom and his sister. And then later on in his life, he also fell hard for his new girlfriend, Samantha. He was trying to build a new life for himself in Newcastle. He had so much ahead of him. He was only 29 years old. And then of course we have Samantha. Following the shooting, she was able to make a full recovery, but she was left with terrible scars, both physical scars, but also mental scars. She has struggled to overcome the terrible ordeal that she went through. And I just really hope that Samantha and her daughter Chanel are doing okay. And I really hope that they are happy. And I also hope that Marissa and all of Raoul's other partners are doing okay and they've recovered. And all of the children of Raoul Mo, I really hope that they are doing well and they are happy as well. But then finally, we also have PC David Rathband. Following the shooting, he was left permanently blind, but he showed so much strength and he recovered. And eventually he was able to rejoin the police force. Obviously he couldn't do what he used to do, but he was still working for the police, which is what he loved to do. But David threw himself into charity work. He actually set up his own charity called the Blue Lamp Foundation, which aimed to support people injured in the line of duty. And after all of his hard work, he actually won the Pride of Britain award. So to the outside world, David had recovered. He was happy. He was doing well. But sadly, that was not the case behind the scenes. David was really struggling. He was really struggling being held up as a hero because inside he didn't feel like one and he struggled to cope with the persona that he almost had to put on in public. He also started to face issues in his personal life. His marriage broke down and this just truly breaks my heart but very sadly in February of 2012 which was approximately 18 months after being shot David Rathband tragically took his own life which is just heartbreaking. I hate that this video has ended like this. So Raoul took two innocent lives as well as traumatizing so many more. And my heart really does go out to the families of David Rathband and Christopher Brown. I really just hope that they are doing okay. And that brings us to the end of today's case. Let me know all of your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And let me know if you remember this case, if you are from the UK. As always, 
always, don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget you can download the game by using the link in my description box. And that is everything from me and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.